What's up, everybody? We're back um, today. We're fortunate to be joined by Robert Tursek, the founder and CEO of Direct Education. Um, in response to the pandemic and the COVID outbreak, he has launched COVID Smart, which is the first worldwide initiative in the gold standard of occupational training um, in the infectious disease prevention. So let's bring Robert on. Um, he has a great background that he's going to share with us and then educate us on COVID Smart. Robert, Thank welcome. You, Mason. I know you're a busy man, so thanks for making some time to come on. I'm psyched to be here. Thanks a lot for having me on. It's fun to see you again. Awesome. So tell for, for our viewers, give a little bit about your your background and some of the neat uh, business projects you've had in the past before we get into COVID Smart and how you're helping us in the moment. Sure, happy to do that. So um, I've been designing and launching digital services for almost 30 years. and. Um, Way back in the day, that was originally satellite TV, and I launched MTV all over the world. I was the creative director for MTV International. And then um, at that point, it was like in the late 80s, early 90s, and I started to see that this thing called the internet was becoming a big deal. So I wanted to get into that with MTV. They weren't ready for that. They were a TV channel. So I switched. It came out to California, started a game company. And um, from there, I really never looked back at TV the same way because I saw that eventually everything you could do on a television, you'd be able to do on the web. And I've been launching interactive services ever since that time. I've done it with big companies like Sony Pictures Entertainment. And I've even worked with Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, uh, where I was a head of digital media for her. And one of the things I learned with Oprah is um, to how to do very large scale educational programs. Uh, you know, Oprah loves to do everything at large scale and reach a lot of people at once. And she thought the internet was particularly useful for education, more so than entertainment. And we proved that was the case because we were able to get audiences in the tens of millions to look at either live or on-demand video, uh, long, detailed interviews with no commercial breaks. And so uh, Oprah proved that you can actually reach people and teach them stuff on the web. And that's really important for the project that we're doing today. COVID Smart is an educational program that teaches people the very best practices and how to prevent an infectious disease from spreading. And we've designed it for workplaces. We've designed it for companies, people who want to bring their workers back and open up and we support that goal. My whole team supports that goal. But of course, we want to do that safely, as safely as you possibly can under the circumstances. So the best way to do that is to teach people what the best practices are to prevent disease. OK, so starting a brand new company during the pandemic, you know, most people are at home sheltering. You were recruiting, building software, striking deals. Yeah. Um, what, what does that look like? And, you know, what was your Obviously, the, the inspiration, the motivation is there to, to help a lot of people, to help a lot of businesses, um, yeah. municipalities. But how do you how do you operate with all the restrictions? Yeah, it's kind of amazing. I, I think uh, it's, audacious, it's audacious in a pandemic to try to start a new company. And considering the fact that we haven't all gotten together in person since this whole uh, lockdown and, and pandemic started. Um, but you're absolutely right. The, the key motivation here is that people want to help. And I'm connected to lots and lots of folks, not just here on Facebook, but all over the web. And there's an enormous number of people that wanted to help. And as it turned out, a lot of people were idle. You know, in that month of March, uh, even April, there were people with tremendous amounts of talent who just weren't able to apply that talent to anything. And most of us thought of this as like a, um, a medical problem, which of course, you know, in the first place it is. It's a medical problem. It's a clinical problem. Uh, if you don't have that skill, you feel sort of useless. You're wondering, what can I do to help? But the way we look at it, Mason, is that this is an information problem. There's an enormous amount of misleading, false, or downright wrong information on the internet. And so the team I've assembled are experts in online education and the ability to launch information products. And what we're seeking to do is help people with better information make better choices, better decisions. Gotcha. So you, you had a really, um, what I think is a, a smart strategic in aligning with APIC the Association for Professional Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Do you yeah. um, want to speak on that partnership and how it validated what you guys are doing at COVID Smart? Yeah, we're very happy to have the support, encouragement, uh, and close working relationship with the folks at APIC. As you mentioned, they're the experts in epidemiology. So my team, we're not experts in epidemiology. We're experts in launching information services. And we felt that we needed the assistance and the guidance of a team that really understands how to deal with epidemics. And so the folks at APIC, these are the folks that draft the guidelines in how to handle infectious outbreaks. So you imagine something like you know, the Ebola outbreak or SARS. 
Uh, these are the folks that actually wrote those protocols, how to deal with it, how to operate during a time of an infectious disease outbreak. We adapted that protocol. We worked together with the COVID-19 task force at APIC and adapted that program for the modern workplace. As crazy as it might seem, this is actually what's necessary. You know, a lot of folks think this yeah. disease is going to magically go away or somehow, you know, we'll, we'll find a cure and that'll solve everything automatically. The reality is the only way to stop an infectious outbreak like this is to change your behavior. You have to actually learn new behaviors. And the cool thing is that APIC had a protocol ready to go, had been tested and tried. It's actually like many years old, so it's well understood that it does work. If you follow these procedures, you're going to reduce the risk of infectious disease tremendously. So at our website, gocovidsmart.com, that's where you can actually sign up for this course and learn how to do these exact same protocols in the workplace. Gotcha. So give us an example of protocols, because a lot of what we hear is from mainstream news. Some people are saying it's good to wear a mask. It's bad to wear a mask. Um, you know, don't don't come within six feet. How? What have you guys just give us a few like hit points for what you guys in APIC have decided are OK, this is what we need to educate people on. Sure thing. Sure thing. You can consider this like the basic level course. Uh, and it starts out with things like what is a virus and how are viruses transmitted? Now, that might seem really basic, right? You might say, well, gosh, do I really need to hear about that information? The fact is you do uh, because there's so much confusing stuff. A lot of people still think that um, you can fight this with an antibiotic. And of course, it doesn't work. Antibiotics only work on a bacteriological infection. This is a virus. A virus can't be affected by an antibiotic. So we have some fundamental stuff there that corrects misperceptions and misunderstandings. And then we get into how to stop it from being transmitted. And most of the course is devoted to stuff that you've already heard about, hand washing, proper sanitation, ways to disinfect its surface, the way to put on and take off a mask. And again, you might say to yourself, well, isn't that perfectly obvious? It turns out it's not. And I'll give you one great example, Mason. Uh, you know, here in Los Angeles where I live, wearing a mask is mandatory now. So if you go to any grocery store or any shopping center, you'll see people wearing masks and half of them aren't wearing the mask properly. So it, it's pointless to give out a mask to a worker but not tell that worker how to put it on properly. If you have a mask and you know, your nose is sticking out or it's hanging down here, or it's all loose on the sides, it really isn't really doing anything to protect you. And in fact, it's like uh, false security. We think that's actually kind of dangerous. So our program tells you exactly how to do these things the correct way, how to take off and how to put on a mask in a safe way without infecting yourself or getting your hands contaminated. Uh, it turns out that's a little trickier than most people realize. And so our course is full of great information like that. And it's presented in a real upbeat way. It's uh, it's actually entertaining and interesting to watch. So we designed it so that's really accessible to everybody who might need that information. Gotcha. Yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of chin, chin straps out there. So <clears throat> tell us, like, if you're, if you're a business, like, uh, we'll get into, I know you're working with some cities, you've rolled out in other countries, um, you guys are, are needed, and people are using you. So that's great. But like if I'm an individual business and I come to COVID Smart and I say, hey, I want to educate my employees and I want um, people to be able to feel comfortable coming into my store. What what's the process like? What's the 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 payment from the the business and and what does that ultimately get them? Sure. Okay. So the the course is designed to solve a whole bunch of problems. Uh, the first one is how do you teach your how do you teach your employees um, how to stop this disease from spreading around. So uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. With Go COVID Smart, what we designed is a traditional compliance course. So it's going to teach you the new, the new behaviors. And it also tests you. It tests you every 30 seconds to one minute to make sure that you understand the content and that you've retained it, remembered it. Now, at the end of that process, uh, each person who takes the course gets a certificate that says they completed the course. And when everybody in the company has completed it, we issue a certificate. It looks like this uh, to the company. And as you can see, there's a green check mark. That's so that you can see it from a distance. You can get a sense, you know, just walking by a store or perhaps from the parking lot, you could see that that place is COVID smart. And then you'll notice there's also a QR code. And that QR code can be scanned by any smartphone. And so anybody walking past the shop can scan the barcode and it'll, it'll say how many people at that place took the test or took the program and completed it, what day they completed it, and which location this is for. So that's really important because that's a way for people to understand that the, the owner of that business cares deeply about the safety of their workers and also the safety of the people who are coming into the store. And so that certificate shows that that uh, business owner, that proprietor has made every effort to try to reduce the risk of infectious disease. So that's what we call COVID smart. You can't say COVID safe. We can't make the promise that everything's safe because the fact is the virus is out there. You know, we haven't got a way to stop that virus just yet. All we can do is change your behavior. So while we can't be COVID smart, so COVID safe, 
we can be COVID smart. Everybody can make smarter decisions about how they proceed. And the signage, the, the, uh, the certificates that you hang in the window, that's a way to send the message out broadly. Now, we think this is going to be really powerful as a way to attract people back into stores. The principal problem we've got right now, and this isn't just in the U.S., this is true around the world. After two or three months of lockdowns and stay-at-home orders, people have been conditioned to realize that public spaces are dangerous, and so they're scared of them. And they're not wrong about that. You know, if you, if you see the research data, you'll see some 60 to 65 percent of people in the United States are very concerned about going out in public. Well, if businesses want to reopen and if we want to put America back to work again and restart the economy, we've got to correct that perception. We have to send a signal that business is taking action to make sure that they can ensure the safety of their workers and by extension, also the people that are visiting. So that's what the certificate program does. COVID Smart is going to give people a way to signal to their customers, to their employers their business partners and the surrounding community that they take this matter very seriously and they're taking every precaution that they can. Gotcha. So, Norm, I was going to hold these audience questions until the end, but this one's too good. From <laughs> Jay Arundel, why isn't the government doing this? So, can you answer that, and then also share some of the the cities and states that you've rolled out with? Yeah, sure thing. Well, you know, there's a this in the United States. There's an interesting political debate happening right in the middle of this crisis, which is a question about what the role of the government really should be. And this is not the only country where that debate is happening. We're seeing examples of that in Africa and in Latin America and other parts of the world where some people say it's not the government's job to tell private business or private people what to do. I'm not going to get into that debate right now. Uh, you know, there's plenty of different views and you can read all about that. What we want to do is do something now. And we thought, well, who actually owns the problem? Like, who has this problem? And we realized if the problem is consumer confidence has gone away, then the person who owns the problem is the business owner. So we designed this program for business owners. We made it really easy for them to get into. And Mason, as you pointed out, city governments are starting to respond to this. They're starting to hear about COVID smart. And they're saying, you know what? We'd like to make our entire business district COVID smart. In the city of Malibu, uh, the mayor there, Mikey Pearson, is a very proactive fellow, a very thoughtful guy. He reached out to us and he said, what would it take to make the whole city of Malibu smart? And we said, well, you know, the best way to go about doing that is to get all the small businesses, all those, uh, there's about a thousand small businesses in Malibu, get them all on board, try to get the majority of them to take this program, teach their workers, because those workers live in the community, right? So if you, if you train people in the store, okay, great, you're solving a problem, you get that certificate, but now you can start to imagine that if dozens and dozens and dozens of stores have that COVID smart certificate, now you're starting to send a community-wide signal. And the signal is that this is how we do it here. This is how our whole community is choosing to behave. We're all going to adopt a new standard of behavior. We're all going to agree to wear masks. We're all going to agree to certain processes so that we don't transmit the disease. I think that's what's missing in the national debate right now. And then the national debate is all politically fractured and people are very partisan and it's kind of an ugly debate. But on the local level, in the town that you live in, it doesn't have to be that way. In the town that you live in, everybody can agree. Yeah, let's just agree to a baseline set of common standards of decent behavior, common courtesy so that we're not gonna infect each other, we're not gonna create an outbreak. Now, in the case of Malibu, their big concern is starting this month, July, they get 14 million visitors to the beaches normally. So you can imagine, they're really worried about a huge number of people coming in from outside. They want the visitors, they certainly need the visitors in their stores, so they definitely wanna be able to welcome those visitors in, but they also wanna telegraph a message of safety, a message that they're doing everything they can to take precautions to prevent the spread of the disease, and thereby they're gonna invite those visitors to adopt the same standards. And candidly, I think that's as much as the government really can do right now. Because if a government comes out with you know, um, a requirement or some sort of edict, you know people are gonna rebel because it's just the nature of the way people are. You know, No matter what the government says to do, half the people are gonna disagree with it. The best thing you can do is create an opt-in standard, we think, where people say, actually, this does make sense. There ought to be a common standard of behavior. And that's what COVID Smart teaches. If you go to go, gocovidsmart.com, you can find out how to sign up for this course and you can make your own community COVID Smart. Gotcha. So you touched on this earlier, but let's just revisit it for the audience. Um, Ethan Yancey says, I would feel more comfortable going into a store with the label, but how can you ensure that the business owner is actually processing the info in the course? Is there a quality control or do you just sit there and press a bunch of next buttons to complete the course? without processing the info? Uh, well, first of all, that's not how the course works. So you can't just press a bunch of next buttons and get through it. You actually have to learn the material. If you get it wrong, you don't fail. You just keep repeating the module until you get that part correct. So there's no easy way to cheat this course. You have to actually go through the whole thing. The course itself was designed by experts in online education in Australia. 
Um, and actually, this is an interesting side aspect of the thing. The reason we were able to launch this so quickly is that uh, I have friends in Australia that I've known for about 10 years, and they've been developing online learning programs. And as you know, Australia and New Zealand are two of the English-speaking countries that responded really successfully to the initial wave of, the, uh, of this, this crisis, this COVID-19 epidemic. They responded really quickly in a good way, a very proactive way. One of the reasons they did that is that uh, the team that works there, uh, my friend Mike Woods and his colleagues, developed this program for industry and industry groups started to teach their employees on the best practices and it spread very quickly. So we've imported that here to the United States and with Apex help, we've adapted it to the modern workplace. Yeah. Uh, so you do have to go through the whole thing. It's it's not a full on compliance training course. That's important to know. It's, there's a certification courses that are like, you know, professional industry standard. This is a different thing. This is a 45 minute class that will teach you the basics in what to do. It's really up to the business owner to enforce that. But bear in mind, and just to answer Doug's question here, um, it's really important for business owners to maintain these standards. So the, the, there's another aspect of this. Uh, what we're providing is a way for business owners to show that they've actually taken this, their employees have taken this course, and we provide an auditable record. And that's really going to be important for those business owners if there's any issue later on. They need to be able to show that they've done something. The biggest risk right now in the United States is if employers ask workers to come back and they don't tell them what to do, and they don't give them a new standard of behavior, and there's no policy about behavior in the workplace, they're asking for it. It's going to be a really big problem. And you've seen examples of this already. Some of the meatpacking plants, we've all seen those stories. We don't have to run that experiment again. We know how the experiment ends. If you don't teach workers what to do, if you don't tell them how to make the workplace as safe as it can be, then you're probably going to have an outbreak. That's a really dangerous outcome. That's bad for the business. It's bad for the brand. It can cost a lot. There could be work shutdowns. There could be lawsuits and so forth. We want to help business owners mitigate all those risks. And the best way to do that is to offer a training program. Right. So in, in your book, Vaporized, you wrote about dematerialization. How has COVID-19 accelerated that process? So, yeah, this is a fun book. I wrote a couple of years ago called Vaporized. Uh, the idea of Vaporized is simply that we're replacing physical stuff with information. Uh, it sounds a little fanciful when I put it like that, but the reality is if you have a smartphone, you're vaporizing stuff all the time. You know, you don't have to have a TV anymore. You can just stream video. You don't have to carry a video camera anymore because you've got your smartphone with you. And so uh, what's happened in the last 10, 10 or 15 years is that the companies that make consumer electronics have experienced double digit decreases in the sales of things like MP3 players, digital cameras, uh, navigation systems and so forth, because all of that stuff has been replicated in software inside your smartphone. And so I got interested in that idea. I've been working in mobile for a long time and I wrote this book, Vaporized, and uh, it turned out to be a pretty successful book. It was uh, it won, you can see I got an award there, International Book of the Year. Um, and uh, and the book has had kind of had a second um, burst of energy because this COVID-19 thing has actually accelerated this process of vaporizing things. Imagine, Mason, overnight, companies across the country and around the world had to make immediate decisions about what to do with all their employees on site. Same thing with schools and universities. Everybody had to figure out really quickly, how do we do this virtually? How do we send people home and do it by extension? And you saw, you know, a couple hundred million people signed up for Zoom in just the space of a month. Uh, so there's this mass I, I, migration of digital replacements for physical things. So it's COVID, I think all, it, it's making us all experts okay. in remote work. Yeah, no, I mean, to me, the, the education, somebody, I don't know if it's true or not, somebody just texted me that Harvard is saying they're doing all 2021 classes online. So um, very by university, yeah, I've heard this as well. Uh, my own feeling about it is, I think it's going to be quite dangerous to bring students back. So any any university or school that's trying to bring everybody back in the exact same way that they usually do it, uh, they're not really dealing realistically with the situation that we've got. Uh, you know, there's this understanding or perception that COVID-19 only affects old people, and that's not true. Uh, anyone can catch, catch COVID-19. 20% uh, uh, of the employees on my team have had it. Uh, one of my uh, one of my colleagues has actually lost a sister who's only 35 to it. Uh, so this is a very, very dangerous disease. It's true that it doesn't affect everybody the same way. And it's also true that if you have a pre-existing condition, it can affect you much worse. But sometimes people are unaware of those conditions. And so this is a dangerous, dangerous disease. It's really important to say that out front because some people say it's just the flu. That's not true. And that's actually dangerous information. That's what we're trying to compete with or, or try to defeat if we can. Uh, so if you yeah. think about a university, 
uh, bringing back students on campus, you, you have to ask yourself questions like, well, what about those big dining rooms? What about the dormitories? What about the big lecture halls? You know, imagine a professor, 57 year old professor talking to 170 students in an enclosed lecture hall for an hour. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. So my advice to those schools would be to take this matter very, very seriously. Now, some schools are going to go fully digital. Uh, we, I think the California schools have already announced that they're going to do that. They're going to be completely remote. Uh, even though that's really challenging in a, whole, in a bunch of different ways, the one thing they're going to ensure thereby is that there won't be people, be people on site having an outbreak of the disease. And that might be prudent under the circumstances. So I, I really like this question from Chrissy Jessica. She says, you've done so many things. It, your core is an entrepreneur. Do you have a guiding motivation on projects that you get involved with? Yeah, yeah, for sure do. Every time I, I start a project, the first question I ask is about the team itself, the people I'm going to be working with. If you're starting a new thing as an entrepreneur, you're going to be working with that team more than anybody else. You're going to see the team you're working with more than you see your family. And that's even true today, even though we're all socially distant or spread apart and working virtually. I'm on Zoom calls eight hours a day with the people I'm working with. And so you better really have good chemistry with those people and you have a better understanding of their uh, strengths and their weaknesses. And you have to have a really honest relationship, the ability to talk about that. So that's the first one is the chemistry of the people. The second one is passion. Where's your passion? Where's your, where is this thing going to bring you the most joy? Every startup business is going to test you in certain ways. You don't know what those ways are until you, until you get there. And if you're not passionate about the project, you're probably going to break and withdraw. So you have to make sure that in your core, this subject matter or this problem that you're trying to solve is something that you're keenly interested in. I happen to be interested in online education. I have been my entire career. I love reaching large numbers of people virtually through digital devices. So this plays right into my strengths. And the team that I'm working with are people that I've worked with for many, many years, in some cases, 20 years. So these are people that I trust, I know, and I can rely upon. And they've been really, really great to work with. I've also teamed up with another group I want to tell you about called Creative Visions Foundation. And the founder of this group is Kathy Eldon. She's been running that for more than 20 years. It's a cool program that reaches all over the world. And the Creative Visions Foundation is something I'm passionate about because they try to activate young people and turn them into creative activists. They support them that way. They do that all over the world. And so we've teamed up with Creative Visions because in many cases, the information we're bringing is going to be brought out to places where we need people on the ground who understand that local culture, who can help us adapt it, who can be evangelists and so forth. So check out creativevisions.org. That's where you can learn about that group as well. My advice for the entrepreneurs is pick something you're passionate about and work with people where you know you've got great chemistry. That's great, great advice. Um, so I'm, I'm going to tie in a question with an audience question. James. Nash asks, do you foresee COVID smart pivoting in some way once the epidemic is under control? And then with that, I would ask, you know, what's your, as close to this as anybody, what's the new normal coming out of this? What's the next 18 months? And how, how do you see things playing out? Yeah, let, let me let me first address that part because the two, the two ideas are connected. So sometimes I'll talk to folks and they'll say, well, wait, there's going to be a vaccine next week, isn't there a vaccine next month? Well, Folks, it's just not true. Uh, there's a lot of vaccine candidates. The last time I checked, there were some 90 different candidate vaccines. And many of those are getting close to a point where they can start doing testing. <laughs> because nobody has natural immunity to this particular disease. So we definitely want to see a vaccine come. But the fastest a vaccine's ever been developed in history is five years. And think about what it takes to actually develop a vaccine. It's not just a matter of developing a candidate and testing it. That could take months. And you actually have to test it and get it prepared at scale and you have to distribute it. Now that's going to take many, many more months. And of course, there's a lot of folks who just don't want to take a vaccine. I and mean, we've seen that a large percentage of Americans, and it's not just something that happens in the, in the United States. A lot of folks don't want to take a vaccine. And so we're going to have resistance there. And that might prevent us from getting to herd immunity, which is when most of the population has enough immunity to slow down or stop the disease from spreading. So from my, my viewpoint, we're going to be in this sort of weird twilight situation where we're testing vaccines. There may be promising candidates. There may be one coming, but there won't be one widely available at mass scale for the entire planet for a couple of years, I think. Maybe it comes sooner, and that would be great, Mason. I'd love to see that happen sooner. But I think the most realistic thing to do is to be prepared for a couple of years where we have these recurring outbreaks that come again and again and again. And everyone's going to have to change their behavior. That's the only thing we can do. When there's no medical solution, when there's no medical cure, if there's no vaccine, and nobody has immunity, the best thing we can do is change our behavior. That's a job for education. Right. Um, so that's the outlook for, for the next couple of years. 
Now, on top of this, uh, what we actually are considering our company, Direct Education, to be is a company that's providing new training skills for 21st century workers. COVID-19 is just driving our business worldwide right now. It's helping us grow to reach worldwide scale. But the fact is there's many other things that workers need to understand about security, about working digitally, about working on uh, re remotely and so forth. And so we foresee a great number of products in the future that can follow on from, from the COVID Smart Program. That's great. Well, Robert, this is this is the most um, of the moment uh, company that we've had presented. I, I appreciate you sharing. You know, I, I've gotten to know you and your team, and um, I'm glad that you guys are on the job because it's necessary. Um, you know, I, I'm really curious to see. We actually head down to the bubble tomorrow in, uh, in Orlando. <laughs> so so. Interesting. I wish you the best there, and I really hope that that folks can keep quarantine and everybody. You know, you have to really think through. It's not just the players and the trainers and the coaches. But it's also the folks that work in the hotels and the restaurants. So uh, again, it's it's like a little community, right? And everybody's dependent on each other. Uh, it's almost like you have to keep your word. You know, um, can you watch out for each other's health? If everybody does and everybody takes the right measures, you'll stay safe. And if somebody doesn't, right. then we're going to find out what happens. You know, and I'm wishing you the best because, of course, we want to see pro sports come back. And you guys are the very first ones to go. So the whole world is watching to see how you do. So yeah. good luck and play well. Thank you. Let, let's run your information. I mean, there, there's been a lot of audience engagement on the chat. People are asking the business model is it a nonprofit. Unfortunately, we're out of time today, but um, I would encourage you guys to reach out to COVID Smart directly. They have a great team and um, they're really helping us out. So thank you, Robert, for what you're doing. I'm glad that Eric, give, give a shout out to Eric Steinbeck who uh, connected us and, um, you know, much, much, uh, much success to you and, and uh, COVID Smart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mason, and, and good luck with the season. I hope it goes really, really well. Very nice to have a chat, the chan chance to chat with all of you. And check us out at gocovidsmart.com. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks, Robert. Sure thing.